for more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hi, welcome to People's Dispatch and Globetrotter. Today, we're very happy to have with us Thomas Isaac. Thomas Isaac is the finance minister of Kerala and has been the finance minister uh, for two runs of the left Democratic Front government, first in 2006-2011, and now in the recent term of the government. He's also a prolific author for leftward books, having published a book called Building Alternatives and Another Challenges to Indian Fiscal Federalism. Um, he has a, a book that was based on a project which he was very much part of the people's planning uh, movement in the 1990s in Kerala, which came out in a book with Richard Frank, recently reissued from leftward books called People's Planning. Um, Thomas Isaac, welcome to People's Dispatch and Globetrotter. Yeah, I'm very happy to be with you. Well, I know you're very busy. You're in the middle of the election campaign for the Legislative Assembly, the new government in Kerala. Polls indicate that the left democratic front is set to break the anti-incumbency history in Kerala since 1980. What do you feel is going to happen, Isaac? What's going on with this election? I feel pretty certain that left is going to be back in power after the election. Now, this will be the first time in Kerala history, there's been only one single occasion, 1977, when the ruling government succeeded to come back in power. Um, otherwise, uh, the power alternative between the left front and the right front, <laughs> we alternate in power every five years. So it must become an axiom of Kerala politics that every fifth year there will be a change in government. And that, I think, has caused uh, a continuity in government, uh, caused uh, Kerala a lot of uh, uh, social advance. For the first time, the left is going to be in power continuously for 10 years. That is sufficiently long enough period to leave very substantial improve, uh, imprint upon Kerala's development process. We hope we will be able to and design a paradigm of development which will prove to be an alternative, a left alternative within the present limitations of Indian federalism, um, which will prove that another world is possible. You see, one of the things that people have been saying is that the government has been very efficient you know, uh, to deal with the floods 2018, 2019, the Nipah virus, um, the uh, advent of COVID-19 and so on. Uh, less recognized uh, underneath all that are the developments you've put in place. You know, you just said that we're going to have 10 years to chart out an alternative. You've done some incredible things on housing, um, even on, on basic infrastructure, you know, that's, I suppose that's what you mean when you say chart an alternative. Tell us a little bit about what that alternative would look like. Okay. Um, it's a kind of hop, step and jump. <laughs> the hope, the first stage is uh, redistributive politics. Kerala has been very noted for that. Our children movement has... Um, has succeeded having significant redistribution of income. Kerala has the highest wage rates in the country. Our peasant movement has been able to redistribute the land and assets through a very successful land reform program. And powerful social movements, which predates even the left movement in Kerala, whose tradition the left has carried forward, has pressurized successive governments which have been in power in Kerala to provide uh, education, healthcare, basic needs of everyone. And therefore, Kerala has an, an honorary person, enjoys a quality of life which is much superior to the rest. Now, this is the situation. But the problem with this process, because we have to spend on social sector so much, there won't be sufficient money for resources for building infrastructure. 
So a program of social development spread over say, more than half a century, there's serious infrastructure deficit in Kerala. So our present government has been very remarkable, as you said, in meeting the crisis, ensuring there's no social breakdown, ensuring that nobody in Kerala would go hungry our, and everybody will get treatment in the COVID times and so on. Uh, but we did something more remarkable. Um, it's true the budget doesn't have the money for the whole infrastructure construction thing. And we calculated we would require minimum half a trillion rupees investment. It's a huge amount of money. Um, immediate infrastructure investment in roads, buildings, bridges, industrial parks, uh, transmission lines, and so on to come to some 50 to 60,000 crores of rupees. Uh, well, what we did was uh, we, government of Kerala under Indian uh, law cannot borrow beyond the limit. Even for that limited borrowing, you have to get the permission from the central government. But this does not apply to, say, body corporates, which are formed by the states, or companies which are formed by the state. So we have a body corporate, Kerala Infrastructure Investment Fund Board, um, which utilized the uh, new instruments, financial instruments, which have been designed under neoliberal rules for the corporates to mobilize money from national, from the country and outside the country. And uh, we mobilized this money. Therefore, we gave permission for construction of this huge amount of infrastructure. After 60,000 crores of rupees, which have been even sanctioned, only 10,000 has already been spent and realized. Others are all in the process. Already this 10,000 crores has produced such a remarkable change in the infrastructure. Um, what we have been seeing Kerala is, through the normal development process, it would have required something like 25 years before 60,000 crores could have been mobilized for this investment. Uh, we have um, encapsulated them into a period of five years, so that uh, within five years, Kerala would have, uh, say, uh, have stepped into uh, a quarter of centuries of infrastructure development. So this has been very really remarkable, and um, it has uh, given a visible impact upon the uh, development. Now, the third is JEP, hop, step, and JEP. And <laughs> so gem is, and that is the program we have placed for the people. Now that's infrastructure is the transmission line, assured electricity, um, industrial parks uh, for investors to come and invest. We will have k form a super highway of internet owned by the state, which is available to any service provider equal treatment to everybody. Nobody will have an advantage. And we are going to provide the uh, internet to everybody. It's a right of every individual. All the poor are getting going to get broadband connectivity free. And so all this has provided a background for us to take the next big jump. That's to say we now want to change the economic base of an economy. Our economic base is uh, commercial crops, which are in serious crisis uh, because of opening out, uh, or labor intensive traditional industries, or very polluting uh, chemical industries, and so on. Though, therefore, we realize now uh, industries which are of our core competence would be knowledge industries, service industries, skill based industries, and so on. Now, how to make this paradigm shift from your traditional economic base to the new? So we have a three prong action. One is, it is becoming popular to work from home. It's estimated 18, uh, 1.8 billion uh, persons will be working from home in another five years. So we have lost out to the race for IT industry 
our parks are very small and uh, other metropolis in india has taken over well we thought this appropriate time we will step in to the world global employment and say we will skill level labor force according to the global demand and we will they will work from home that anybody from the world can global employees can hire the educated unemployed persons who are skilled this is going to have a tremendous impact upon women's supply so this is number one two we are restructuring our higher education so that kerala becomes a innovation society the innovations are will be transformed to startups we are thinking of creating a big ecosystem for startups which will bring a new breed of entrepreneurs into kerala third we are willing for any investor to come and invest in kerala we guarantee them ease of doing business uh, funds there is an agreement we will keep the agreement we will work them them we will give them incentives so in a period of another 5 years our economic base would change now that will create a new kerala see in india the paradigm of development there are three models one is gujarat i would say who are very rapidly industrializing but there is little welfare and social security people they have fairly high uh, poverty um, illiteracy ill health and so on then there is this kerala where there is very little industry but we have ensured everybody welfare and of course there, there is whole bimaru states where there is neither industry no welfare now this is the situation now we want to create a kerala which will assure every individual dignity of life and security and welfare at the same time we will challenge uh, gujarat and other states we will be growing even faster than them and that will be very different we are going to say yes it is possible to have redistribution yet ensure the growth and that's the one. within this framework we are not a socialist country uh, we are part of indian uh, capitalism but in this part within the limitations we shall design a society which will inspire the old progressive thinking people in india yes it is possible to build something different and uh, that's the idea of kerala so the kerala model 2.0 is hop step and jump and <laughs> the second term is jump well yeah. you know one of the books you did for leftward was building alternatives which was about the uralangal um labor contract cooperative society the reason i'm bringing this up is that a bridge was recently completed in kerala and i saw that the chief minister pinara vijayan had you know tweeted about how this society was part of the construction of the bridge the reason i'm thinking about this is you know your your building infrastructure but the labor practices involved in the building of the infrastructure should i think be emphasized as well here you have a cooperative society involved could you talk a little about that oh it's true you know see i just gave you three plans of welfare infrastructure and the new enterprise society going to come now in the welfare which includes uh, schools uh, healthcare and so on, we think uh, participation is going to be the key to ensure better uh, service delivery and quality of services for which we think to ensure participation we need to have decentralized uh, uh, democracy uh, decentralized session program democratic decentralized session that we have ensured uh, we have the most vibrant local governments and therefore uh, this social intervention collective intervention at local level in providing better services improving the productivity of small scale industries and so on it's a fact that's one second is now the type of new enterprises that are going to come into kerala not to, to build infrastructure but also new enterprises i told about startups but besides startups 
we are going to be screen with a whole lot of other social enterprises let me put it that way where cooperatives are going to play very very important role cooperatives will play two major roles one is providing credit recently we did a financial innovation again um we, we have a three tier credit cooperative societies now we integrate the top two tiers and then get it got it as registered as a scheduled bank and this is the second largest scheduled bank in kerala um and um, i am certain this is very soon going to be the largest bank in kerala and that gives us the leverage to channelize funds into enterprises and so on. secondly the cooperatives are also going to provide a base for say agro processing industries even um, say electronic or it collectives and so on. model is the society is probable now these are very embedded in the radical uh, history of kerala this society came to be in the early 1920s as a part of social reform movement where some radical social thinkers the workers followers were uh, ostracized by the community and therefore they didn't give up they decided they started a small credit society and then they started a workers cooperative which would undertake uh, contract work and uh, they designed democratic way of functioning all the directors will have to go and work and in the evening after the work the director board will meet and have a transfer system accounting and so on. so this society from 1920s was the a labor cooperative society and um, and why the people's planning came we were looking around for a uh, model of social enterprise and we found we can bypass the contractors are having labor cooperative like this and therefore this became the celebrated model and many cooperatives like this came in and this also gave this chance of cooperative to diversify the group and within another 20 years became the major enterprise not just a lab contractor they became a provider of hotel services okay now they are developers they develop institutions and so on they have diversified into now various ways something like montreal you know we get a prize um and the important thing is efficiency most modern technology they are adopted and in which they they can contract we compete with any major indian uh, developer or contractor recently they have just got the major stretch of national highway from the central government uh, competing with all others so this is an important for a new experience that it is possible to promote social enterprises we are not going to replace all private enterprises but there will be a social sector which will i think also say give a sense of balance uh, give an traditional instrument for the progressive forces to intervene in the economic sphere so recently as you said um, in a record time in the past government they built their bridge even before inauguration was falling apart so we decided to rebuild it and it was said rebuilding would require uh, one year it will reduce to 8 8 months then they did it in a record period of 5 months 500 workers working day and night and constructing and replacing demolishing and reconstructing it is amazing uh, <laughs> architectural enterprise so it just caught everybody's imagination what this society did so chief minister caught and brushed <laughs> <laughs> who built uh, all the pyramids <laughs> who built now that stacks up yeah <laughs> that's right uh, that's one of brecht's best stanzas uh, who builds the pyramids who puts up this who does that well in kerala it seems to 
be these labor cooperative societies that are part of the fabric. Returning just briefly to the election, um, you know, uh, you, you, you're, you're like the polls, everybody's anticipating the left democratic front will come back into power for another term, five year term. Uh, what will this mean for the Congress uh, front? What will this mean for the Bharatiya Janta Party? They are in power in Delhi after all. What is this going to mean for them if in 36 million people Kerala decide to reject the Congress and the BJP? All right. See, Kerala politics has been polarized between the left and not so right. The right in Kerala cannot be right in the outside Kerala. <laughs> they, nobody can say against uh, higher wages or against, uh, say, um, public education, public health, and so on. So the whole ideology, the broad hegemonic power, the state, the left has, has left is imprint upon the right also. But power alternates is between the two. Now it will be the first time that uh, really the left is going to be back in power for, for two consecutive terms. The main reason has been I tell you, the performance of the government, the way we dealt with the crisis, ensured welfare, and then brought in this infrastructure revolution and putting forward an agenda. Yeah. <laughs> the jump, the main jump is going to come and everybody wants it. It's a new Kerala. So we are going to be back in power. What are the implications? The, Right, the Congress uh, coalition has been taking a strange step. They have been telling the minorities in Kerala who come to be around 50% of the population, you defeat us, our rank at five will go to BJP. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> stick to the old pattern of powers. In fact, it may look silly, but a very important political move trying to tell uh, the electorate that if you want to keep Kerala free of BJP, you should elect us because otherwise our rank and file will desert. But I don't buy that. For the simple reason, of course, there will be erosion to BJP from the right, uh, but uh, from Congress particularly. Uh, but I don't think uh, Congress will be decimated in Kerala. Um, for the simple reason, uh, Kerala ethos is secular. Our renaissance in the 90s, starting in the 19th century, uh, he has this sort of you know, very little revivalism. It, it is, in fact, a reinterpretation of tradition, progressive interpretation of uh, that tradition. And the greatest ideal of Kerala renaissance is the dictum by one of the sages, Sri Narayana Guru, who said, it doesn't matter what religion you are, as long as you're a good human being, okay? Um, so this is ingrained in the thinking of everybody. Uh, and therefore, uh, somebody from inspired from North India coming into Kerala and say, if you want to be a good human being, you have to be a Hindu, he just does not <laughs> Run in Kerala. Nobody accepts that. That's why, despite the fact, RSS has always had one of the strongest units in Kerala. Their representation in RSS uh, has been uh, proportion to population, the highest in the country. They have never received mass support. And given the social composition of Kerala, which is half minorities, BJP is not even going to be the main opposition, never in Kerala. Okay, let me put it that very frank. But a defeat of coalition, Congress coalition, would weaken them, which would mean Kerala is going to have not just next five years, I think more five years in the future, unless it does something very bad, very bad. Otherwise, that's what the logic of politics is. That gives us an opportunity, an opportunity of really designing a more democratic, uh, participatory, 
and society uh, which at the same time ensures uh, decent employment and growth. Um, I think that will be something fantastic. Um, that is to say, the Indian, there has been erosion of strength of the left in India in the last two decades. If you look at the history, the 50s, 60s, 70s, you have seen, it is the left which again that they spent in the decline of the Congress. But from the late 70s, what has happened is Congress continued to decline, but now it is the right, far right, which is meeting advantage of. But there are new shoots we can see in various parts of the country, states in the small elections and so on, which gives some hope. So uh, Kerala would be uh, the, the left bastion, left base, from which we have much of. There is a, not a great book, but there is a book by Victor Fick, which has a title which has always attracted me. Uh, Kerala, the Yanan of India. <laughs> so, so I would say, yeah, there has been waning of uh, left in India, but we'll provide the Yanan base. Uh, I think Kerala project, democratic project, has something very important uh, for Indian left. Um, Thomas Isaac, I have to say firstly, uh, good luck in the election. Uh, good luck to you. Good luck to the left democratic front. Uh, good luck to the Communist Party of India, Marxists, but more than anything, good luck to the people of Kerala. Um, they're going into an interesting election, and I hope it will be a safe and, and reasonable, rational outcome. Uh, I hope you get time to rest. Thanks so much for being with us at People's Dispatch and Globetrotter. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm in LAP. I'm in charge of the election in the LAP district. And... Um, uh, and Everybody is waiting for the election day. I think some history is going to be made in case will be back in future terms, which will have far reaching implications for not only Kerala's development, but also for the rest of the country. That's amazing. Thanks a lot. Thank you.